All right, stop everything, drop everything, drop that snow globe collection, drop grandma's china, drop those precious moment figurines because we are turning the car back around. We are not going to the thrift store anymore, guys, because haven't you heard? Minimalism is dead. It's dead, it's dead as a doornail. It's kaput, mm. it's a goner. It's been a long time coming. Minimalism has had a long and fruitful reign over us millennials. Millennials are uncool, millennials are old, and minimal minimalism is dead. So we have we have a lot to unpack here. My name is Teresa and this this is a death of minimalism. Minimalism is a lifestyle choice. It's a mindset. It's a millennial mindset. Minimalism has reigned for about 10 to 15 years and it has been very strong. It was very revolutionary and it was actually incredibly revolutionary. Now everybody is sick of it. Now everybody is sick of the stark and clinical celebrity homes that you see on Instagram or Architectural Digest. And now people want color, people want fun, people want stuff again. With quarantine, with being trapped in your home, you want to make everything in your home comfy, you want creature comforts, you want to look at something on your shelf and be reminded of when you went on vacation. You want, you want souvenirs. But before we get into the rise of maximalism, of clutter core, why clutter is cool again, I wanna take a step back and remember minimal minimalism, when it happened, how it revolutionized our lives. And by our, I mean the millennial life. I think like older generations, boomers, Gen X, they were very resistant from absorbing real life comments, reading very mean online comments on other people's content. They were very resistant because they come from a generation where you had things. The American dream is to aspire to acquire things, many things, a big house, a big McMansion. It's Italianate furniture. You also acquire things from your parents, from your grandparents. You got grandma's china, grandma's silverware, your parents' anniversary scrapbook. You have everything. You have wedding gifts that you can't get rid of. You have a crock pot that doesn't work, but Aunt Ginny gave you the crock pot. But Aunt Ginny and Uncle Conrad, they're not with you anymore. So the only thing you have to remember them by is this crock pot from the 70s and you can't get rid of it. It's never worked, but you've got to stuff in your garage with probably hundreds of other things that you don't need anymore, but you've got to got to keep it for some reason. And then your garage fills up, get a storage unit. And then that fills up. You can't pay the bills on your storage unit. And then suddenly your storage unit is on like storage wars or something. Prior to millennials coming of age, prior to the 2008 recession, we have all been, and by we, I mean the United States, a culture of acquiring things. That's the American dream. Going back through the centuries to the Renaissance, to the broke, to Western history. The the bigger your house, the more cars you have, the more stuff you have, the quality of your stuff, it has always been a symbol of wealth and it's always been aspirational. And that was the American dream. The American dream has always been to have a executive Costco membership, a 3,000 to 5,000 square foot home, a lawn, a backyard. What do you do with this big house? You furnish it with furniture and then you have rooms that you don't even use. Like I've never understood what the point of having like a family room and a living room is because I've always grown up in a tiny home. So we didn't have a family room. But as a kid, I visited relatives who had a family room and I'm like, that's it right there. Forever and always, having more things has been a symbol of wealth. That is especially the case in the early 2000s. The early 2000s was an era of excess. The time of McBling got embellished rhinestone shirts that says Bibi. You have low rise apple bottom jeans. You have whale tails, rhinestone trucker hats. You have a huge bag that you could probably carry a child in. It was the time of Paris Hilton. It was the time of Fergie. It was the time of McBling. Bling. It was a time of excess. It was the time of that documentary, The Queen of Versailles, about a woman who dressed early 2000s Barbie core, building a giant home and not being able to fund the building of said home. When the dream was to acquire a big giant McMansion, more square footage than you need. And then now that you have this huge home, you've got to furnish it. So you end up spending more money to furnish this home, all in the name of showing off 
enough that you've made it in life. The era of owning more than you can actually afford, it all led to the housing collapse and the Great Recession of 2008. So after that turning point, it no longer became cool to associate yourself with the rich. And we're all now suffering, we're all now poor. Divest yourself of your rhinestone trucker hat and divest yourself of your McMansion. Divest yourself of all that ugly furniture. From personal experience, I really began to notice the minimalism trend heavily around 2010. I saw it not so much in we had to get rid of and declutter all our things so we could live a Spartan lifestyle and a clean and simple Scandi interior decor kind of sense, but I saw it in the graphic design of many startup Silicon Valley companies. The graphic design became much more sleek and I want to say not to beat a dead horse, minimal, simple colors, solid millennial pink. Gone were the gaudy early 2000s design. Gone were the serif fonts. Now you had very stripped down sans serif. And because it was so simple in a sea of excess, it stood out. It was new. It was like a breath of fresh air. When you buy an iPhone, you open it up and it is just clean and simple. No nonsense. Started over time to mean luxury, which was a new concept back then because forever and always having a lot of things, having a lot of material goods, a lot of heavy furniture, attics and basements meant that you were well off. It's just been ingrained in us. The wealthy had a lot of things. You saw when you go to museums, you see these paintings, people in the Baroque era and the Renaissance era, like your entire wealth was in your material possessions. Silver, you had still lives with all the food, a cornucopia. You had lush grand foyers full of paintings, grand banisters, lifestyles of the rich and famous, everything, everything. If you ever take historical house tours, you will see it set up like this. The master of the house had grand ostentatious dining rooms, crystal chandeliers, colonial furniture, federal furniture, majestic four poster beds. Whereas the health, they had a very simple room, very minimal room, just like a twin size bed, a cot, a wash basin, a chamber pot. That's all they had. And they probably had maybe three outfits in their closet. The poor in the past, they were living the minimalist lifestyle, not by choice. But then within the past 10 years, owning a few things was not considered bad. It was considered desirable. And it also slowly began to signify your wealth. Because if you live in this grand city penthouse, restoration hardware, cloud couch, all white could get dirty if you just look at it. All white kitchen, a shaggy Sherpa rug. You need to keep it clean. So if you can keep all that clean and maybe you'll have help and it's easier to clean because you don't have a lot of things, a lot of knickknacks, tchotchkes to dust. It signified you were wealthy. You didn't need a bunch of items in your pantry, in your storage. You didn't need all that because you could go out to eat. So like back in like the Victorian times, wealthy people had to have a lot of things in their possession because there was not that many restaurants back then. So you can't go out to eat. You had to have servants make food in your home. So it's in your best interest to own a lot of items. But nowadays, richer people, they could just go out to eat. They could just order DoorDash. They could order sugar fish sushi. Or they could just go out to eat every single night and they don't have to come home and cook and grind wheat or flour or whatever you grind. What do you grind? I think you grind wheat or like little peppers. You don't have to grind peppers in a mortar and pestle. So everything you own is sleek and beautiful and simple and you are aware of every single item that you own. And because you own so few things, you can invest in the quality of your items. They could be more expensive items. If you buy cheap, you buy often. Well, you don't need to do that because you are buying a $12,000 Eames lounge, something from design within reach, which is very expensive, not really within reach, but you know what I'm getting at here. The few things that you own are of quality and you'll take care of it more and you'll treasure it more. I think it's actually a, still a very beautiful concept. Having gone through decades of owning more things signifies that you've made it getting rid of all of it and just concentrating on a few select quality items and living a more intentional life, being more intentional in what you buy. It was a revelation. After some time, you have a lot of dupes of the same Eames chair, the same mid-century modern furniture, the same white on white, gray on gray, beige on beige. More instances than not, this signifies gentrification. Typical furnishings you would find in a five over one apartment building building, which was built to look modern, but because they built so many of them and so cheaply, everything's all starting to look the same. You 
could buy a knockoff Eames chair. You know this chair, you see it in many Airbnbs. You can buy that off Amazon for the price of a song. Everything is just starting to look boring, bland, vanilla. It's starting to look the same. It wasn't until 2016 when I fully adopted the minimalist mindset when I read along with most of America and the world, Everyday Magic of Tidying Up. What is the book I read? The Life Changing Magic of Tidying Up by Marie Kondo. Ah, she was our guru, guys. I read this book, it opened my eyes, and the next thing you know, I'm going through my closet, I'm looking through every single item. Do I need 20 different cheap juniors dresses? I would pick it up, feel it, ask myself, does this spark joy? Do I need this in my life? And I packed up my clothes and sent it to the thrift store. And then I went through my entire home for kitchen items. Do you need 50 different kitchen gadgets? Do you need a junk drawer? I even went so far as to comb through an entire lifetime's worth of journals. I said, these journals are taking up a lot of space. Am I gonna read through all of them? But I can't really get rid of them because they're my journals, they're my thoughts. So I spent two weeks ripping them out of their binding and scanning them. So now all my journals are digitized. I went through a rampage on getting rid of paper items. I even went through all my photos, actual photos from the 90s. I would scan them and then I would just shred them. And that was quite an odyssey, let me tell you. So I really adopted this spark joy minimalism thing. To be honest, I'm still kind of living it. I mean, as you can see, I have things, but I still consider myself a minimalist. I'm not an extreme minimalist. I'm very intentional of what I buy and I make sure that if I buy one item of clothing, I have another one on the way out. Say if I had to grade myself as a minimalist, 10 being like an extreme minimalist, somebody who only owns 10 clothing items and sleeps on a tatami mat on the floor and has no furniture, maybe only own 37 items. I think I'm about like a five. My mom, sorry mom, she was a low grade hoarder. I mean like, you know, Asian parents, you got that pork sung container, you finish the pork sung, or you finish some container of items and then you reuse it for something else. That's actually very good for the environment because you're not throwing anything away. Technically being a hoarder is good for the environment. I was hardcore into watching minimalist content on YouTube. That was like my number one thing that I love to watch and it was very calming for me. And it gets me so energized and so pumped up. I would watch Nat Diavella. I don't remember her name, but she was the extreme minimalist with no furniture was, and she literally slept in a hammock in her apartment. I was also really into those 10 things I no longer buy as a minimalist, 10 things that I decluttered as a minimalist, things I regret in my 20s because, you know, getting rid of negative emotions, that's also a part of minimalism. It's a mindset thing. And it was always an aspirational thing for me because around my apartment, there's clusters of clutter, a cluster of Costco items on the floor. So part of my space is like Costco hoarder and part of my space is aspirational minimalist, and that's what I am. There's another book that I love even more than Marie Kondo's book, and it's called Goodbye Things. The writer Fumio Sasaki, an editor living in Tokyo, he only owns like 37 items. This guy is serious because he has no bed, he has a tatami mat, he has no furniture, he has maybe a desk and a MacBook. He uses the same kind of soap for his body and his hair and for his dishes, and he eats out most of the time, or he eats the same thing every day. It eliminates decision fatigue. I I have to say that it really influenced me. Anytime I get anxiety and I see clutter, I think about pictures of his home. It just really calms me down. I like to think about Japanese people living in their very Spartan Tokyo apartments. The sunlight streaming through the bleach wood floors with nothing in it. That is exactly what gets me going. And I still aspire to that. You know, if I had my say, I would get rid of all these books because they're they're not my books. I'm not married to this typewriter. I could get rid of this too. I could get rid of all of this, but I won't. I still really like minimalism. It's not a trend for me. It's a state of mind. I'm not giving it up. That's one thing I'm not decluttering, but I can see that people have been forced to quarantine and stay in their home. They want to feel comfortable. They want to feel cozied up and then living in a stark, 
clinical environment doesn't bode well for your mental health. So you want you want items, retail therapy, go on Amazon, go on TikTok, all the must have, must buy items. You gotta have it in your home and it makes you feel better. You gotta have like LED clouds above your ceiling and the foam mirror and then curvy postmodern furniture. It's, it's a serotonin boost. I can see the maximalist points that having things gives you a sense of personality. Like if you invite somebody over to your home and they see a map with thumbtacks of all the places that you visited and they see like a didgeridoo in the corner from when you went to Australia and you blow on it and then they see like a snow globe from your trip to Disneyland and then you set up your Christmas tree and you have all your ornaments or your baubles that does lend itself to a story or if you have grandpa's writing desk that's a legacy and I can definitely see that point so right now minimalism we're sick of it everybody's home is looking the same beige clinical just blah so now maximalism or clutter core is in maximalism is clashing different patterns plaid wallpaper with a floral armchair a giant monstera plant together with tall fainting couch I'm just making all this up. Basically a clashing of patterns. Minimalism was always so uniform, samey, samey. Minimalism was more of a mid-century modern bent and maximalism is big, bold, colorful patterns, clashing of patterns and having many items around your home. You've thought about some of the colors matching with the major furniture pieces. It comes together in a way. There's a color scheme, a theme. Imagine a shelf. A minimalist shelf would have one vase one succulent, coffee table books, the Tom Ford coffee table book laid horizontally, the Kinfolk Home magazine collection, and a maximalist shelf would have a bunch of souvenirs, tchotchkes, but curated. There's premeditation behind this. And then clutter core, I associate mostly with the Gen Z bedroom. A lot of little action figures, anime action figures, the fake vine that goes around twinkly lights, a whole wall full of art prints, stickers that you've collected or badges or pins, trophies, books, books galore, plants, fossils, crystals, trinkets. You love trinkets. There's no rhyme or reason. Maybe you have an inkling of an idea of where things go, but more or less, it's just like wherever you have space, put your item there. And there's tons of items, hundreds even. It's a very busy look, but it also tells a story. So you invite your guests over to your bedroom, to your living room, and there's an infinite amount of things for them to look at. I do appreciate when I visit somebody's house that they have things because one of the things I love to look at when I visit anybody's home is their bookcase. I love to see what people read. When it comes to me, well, first of all, I never have anybody over. There's no parking and I'm kind of short on friends at the moment. And I also read the Swedish death cleaning book and Swedish death cleaning is a mentality among Swedes to take care of your personal possessions, take care of your finances and declutter your home so that your children don't have to go through the heartache of taking care of your things. You're thoughtful of your children. You're not leaving them with a hoarder's house to clean after you die. It's very, very painful for your children probably dealing with your finances. They're going through tumultuous feelings and to add cleaning an entire messy house on top of that. The Swedes, they believe that if you clean up everything while you're still alive, while you're in retirement age, and if you say you have certain memories that you would like to share with your children, why wait till after you're dead? Do it while you're still alive so you could both remember together, you could both bond together. It's a very selfless decluttering cleaning act so you can prevent adding to your children's grief and also not wasting their time. A very messy house, a very cluttered house, so you could be cleaning that out for weeks. You have to take time off your job, to take personal days, and you probably have to hire a junk hauler, to be honest, and that costs money. That, unfortunately, is not a mentality in America. I think the general mentality in America is to do what you do, hoard it all up. Your children will take care of it when you're dead. It doesn't really matter how they feel. It doesn't matter if you're adding to their grief. It doesn't matter if you're taking time from their busy parenting or work schedule or whatever, because, you know, nowadays we live in capitalism here. Everybody's got to work till they're dead. You're dead. What does it matter to you? I'm not going to give my personal opinion, but I go with the Swedes here on this one. Swedish death cleaning. I endorse it. So if I were to get hit by a bus tomorrow, my husband has like literally nothing to worry about. Everything I own 
literally be stacked up in a corner. All my files, all my personal documents, money, everything is in neatly organized folders. Like I'm, I'm good. I'm set. This is a PSA to the boomer generation because you know, you got, you got one foot in the grave already. Let's be honest. Let's make things easier on your children or your grandchildren. Don't add to their grief. They love you. They're going to miss you. Don't make them clean out your hoarder house. Clean out your hoarder house now. Maybe you can bond and clean out your hoarder house together. So that's all I have for you today. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you. I'll see you next time.